right. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Well, good evening. Well, my topic is going to be about our efforts to communicate with bees. And we actually have, we view this not so much as using bees to do what we do, but that we actually partner with the bees and we, we together solve problems. Now, before I start this talk, I will remind everybody that these, these talks are recorded. I have loaded a lot of citations into this PowerPoint, so don't worry about trying to take notes now because I'm going to race through a lot of stuff in a hurry, but uh, in a few days, the recordings will be posted up to the WAS website, and at that time, you can go through, stop the PowerPoint presentation whenever you want and study the charts and so on, so you can get to it that way. If you really want a copy of the PowerPoint, you can send me an email. I use an American online account. It is simply B Research. That's spelled B E E as in honeybee, B Research at AOL.com. Anyway, I've been studying insects, insect sounds, and insect behavior since 1968. However, I started with grasshoppers and their mating calls and signaling. But it took me until about 1973 when I started looking at bees around the coastal power plants. So they started focusing exclusively on honeybees. Now, I work with teams. And since 1973, our focus has been on um, a variety of uh, things from pollutant monitoring to actively finding things like landmines to rapid detections of clouds of poisonous gases, things like sarin gas. And more recently, we're working on detecting and mapping more or less in real time outbreaks of bee pests and diseases. Uh, I pioneered the use of honeybee colonies as sentinel systems for the detection and mapping of pollutants over landscape scale areas. My teams and I have looked at urban and rural areas at the US Department of Energy National Laboratory sites, on Department of Defense sites, on EPA Superfund sites, and we even work with Croatian uh, scientists after Chernobyl went off. And I'll show you in a moment a slide from that study. We saw some very interesting things. Now, beginning in 1995, we started monitoring the behaviors of colonies using the first smart hive. So before Broodbinder, before almost anything else out there, we were already doing uh, this kind of monitoring. Now, our smart hives had multiple types of sensors, temperature, humidity, scales, pollen traps by time of day, you name it. If we could think about it, we stuffed it in the hive. And these hives streamed us data from the East Coast around the Edgewood area of Aberdeen Proving Grounds near Baltimore. It came, all the data came down to Montana over telephone lines, but we had to move it at night, both for the cost of the rates and also the bandwidth we needed to move all that data forward. That capability to monitor real time what bee colonies were doing and stream it across the nation attracted the attention of DARPA, the US Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. And it led us eventually to the training of the bees to find things like landmines. Then in 2005, we switched our focus to the use of colony sounds for the rapid detection of harmful chemicals and later, and what we are currently doing is we're using the sounds that the colony itself produces to detect and map outbreaks of insect pests and diseases, things like mites and fowl brood. Now, I think of a honeybee as a like is basically a sampler that's like a flying electrostatic dust mop. And they pick up electrostatic charges and things pop onto their bodies and stick to them. They inhale and respire a lot of air, so they're filling the air in their bodies that they bring it in. And as such, everything in the environment, whether it's radioactive materials, heavy metals, things like anthrax even, um, the um, solvents like used for dry cleaning, explosives, pesticides from the soil, the plant, the water and the air, it all comes into a beehive. So think of the beehive as a giant air sampler it effectively is, is sampling an area of at least a mile, maybe even up to two miles out. Now multiply that by multiple hives and you suddenly have the ability to go to, to landscape levels, especially if those hives are set out across some type of grid across a region or an area. So as a quick summary, um, our, um, I, I'll tell you this, I retired from full-time research at U of M in 2012, and then I turned to online teaching with four other instructors. And we now have an online master beekeeping course running every week, 43 weeks of the year. And we reach over 20 
countries. So my retirement didn't quite go the way I expected. Now, recently I finished a two-year term as the WAS president, and I'm purposely stepping back because I got a new contract. I'm working with retired Colonel Gary LaGrange in Manhattan, Kansas, and we're developing a beekeeping course for soldiers and others who are interested in working for or becoming commercial beekeepers. So that's going to be my focus for the next couple of years here. In addition, my teens and I keep busy through projects uh, that we do on under our the umbrella of our technology transfer company, BeeAlert. We finished two research projects, one in New Zealand and one for, for the state of Florida this year. And we are now focusing most of our efforts. We, we're finished with, we don't have any big contracts to do research at the moment. We're gonna focus our attention for the next couple of years on getting our B Health Guru Acoustic app out get it tested, get it uh, reporting on outbreaks and getting it fully calibrated. Now, here's our gorgeous test subject. Um, if you're wondering, this is not a photograph. This is a digital sculpture that can be rotated 360 degrees. This is the work of a very talented uh, 3D digital sculpture expert by the name of Eric Keller. And Eric does some wonderful, he, he works for the television, for the movie industry, television, for places like planetariums and so on. But if he had another life, I think Eric would be, become an entomologist. He's fascinated by insects. And so whenever he tests out a new piece of software, he uses the insect as the subject. So here's an illustration from his series on the nervous system of a honeybee. And again, these it, he can provide these in a format that you can rotate and look at it from every angle, uh, front and back, top to bottom, whatever. And most recently, he's uh, done a wonderful series that's animated in these digital sculptures of how the insect eye and vision work. So I, I, I one of the things tonight is I want to introduce you to some things you probably haven't seen before. In the Jerry, work of Eric Keller, one to see. Yes. Jerry. Could you uh, turn off your video because um, it's taking too much bandwidth and the slides are not coming through clean. Okay, just a sec. Thank you. That better? Hello? You still there? Yeah, we're still here. It's all good. Okay. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry, yes, it, it helped. Yeah, oh yeah, much better, Jerry. Okay, let me go back to that other slide for a moment. There. Hopefully that one comes through clear. That's gorgeous. Okay, and there's one of his ner uh, the nerve system and the uh, internal workings of a bee. And another one, I don't know, Randy, if you've caught up with this, but Lars Chitka has putting out a new book on the mind of a bee. It will be available in June of this year. He's got it. It's up as of last week for pre-purchase from uh, Princeton press or Amazon or some other places. But basically, Lars has been doing a lot of work on the neurobiology of bees and their cognitive capabilities. He says they're profoundly smart, have distinct personalities, can recognize flowers and human faces, exhibit basic emotions, count, use simple tools, solve problems, and learn by observing others. And we would fully agree with that, with the work we do with training bees. And Lars even postulates they may even be, have self-awareness and consciousness. So I'm going to talk to you tonight about a little bit about the type of thing to steal and Rich did, but I also want to talk a little bit about citizen science projects. And here's some um, references to some that we've done. In the, and what I want my point here is that citizen science things are often fun things to do, but they can be more than fun things. And we have a specific example that we did in the early 1980s. Uh, in the 1980s, we conducted a large-scale study in the Puget Sound region around Seattle. Beekeepers and beekeeping associations from Yelm, which is south of Tacoma to up on northern Whidbey Island, almost to, to Canada, took bee samples and made colony observations for us as part of an investigation of the dispersion radius of emissions from the Asarco copper smelter that was operating in Tacoma. This became a groundbreaking study combining citizen science, volunteers collecting samples and making measurements, 
these as environmental samplers and the use of a unique geospatial statistical analysis approach that allows us to map the dispersion of those chemicals over wide areas. And here's an example of, the mar of one of the key maps. This is for arsenic. The Asarco smelter was um, estimated to be releasing a ton of arsenic a day. The smelter said that their arsenic, lead, cadmium, and other things they were putting out did not extend much past a half a mile to a mile. And if you look at the map on the left, the map on the left is basically the reach or the part of the, uh, of the area that the Sarco would own up to possibly causing some contamination problems with. You see Vashon Island there, actually we later showed and others that uh, extensive contamination across this, but we followed this all the way up to uh, Vancouver and uh, almost Vancouver on Whidbey Island Later, the Canadians said that uh, when the smellage stopped uh, working, their arsenic levels dropped. So that top blue line, we're still two times higher in arsenic than uh, background levels should be. And the, uh, this was not just in, kind of a curiosity study. This was actually GLP, Good Laboratory Practices, audited by EPA. We, our beekeepers, our volunteers passed with flying colors. Uh, the data was published in a very prestigious journal, Science, uh, in 1985. And when this, this was a huge Superfund site, and EPA had a large uh, community hearing on this Superfund site that lasted a week, was in an auditorium that uh, several hundred people were able to attend, and EPA had a panel on a stage. And for several days, the Sarko talked about what they knew they were releasing and what problems they recognized and, and what they, how they interpreted. And the bottom line was you got the impression that if, unless you live right beside the smelter, it wasn't much of a problem. Surprisingly, I had already finished this uh, project and published it when I got a call from EPA and then from the Puget Sound Air Pollution Control Agency, which is a joint Pierce County, King County um, state agency they wanted me to testify at this hearing. Little did I realize at the time that no, the, when the company stopped with their last expert, who basically poo-pooed any risk to humans, the next speaker, the first speaker from the Washington state side of the fence for a different perspective was this study done by our beekeepers. And this essentially was the first proof that the smelter in Tacoma was spreading emissions all the way to Canada. And in 2003, a follow-up study, they didn't know that we had done this study. They did an extensive study on Vashon Island, confirmed everything we found and even the dispersion patterns, and they were just amazed. So it wasn't too much long after that hearing that the Tacoma smelter shut its door forever and the company moved to the Philippines. So what I'm saying here was that this was not just a fun citizen science project. This was a citizen science project that became key evidence and a major issue about who and where the emission, who was at, at risk and where the true emissions of arsenic, lead, cadmium, I'm just showing you the arsenic map, were going in this area. Um, the, and the GLP people were amazed that the beekeepers could uh, deliver data that met their stringent quality uh, standards. So we're very proud of this. We're proud of our beekeepers and we're proud of the bees. Now, the, on a simpler sale, and this is a one person citizen science project, but I did tell you we did some work with Chernobyl. And for those of you who are old enough to remember Chernobyl, when it went off in 1986, um, basically was a, a world a threatening event, um, but if you really want to get an idea of the impact of Chernobyl, my friends uh, Nikola Kezik in Croatia found a beekeeper in the Alps that kept every year for his own records a bottle of honeydew, neck, uh, honeydew honey, and he put a bottle in religiously every year. And he had bottles all the way back to 1952. And in 1994, they found that he had that whole time from 52 to 94 covered. And so going from right to left in the order of this, you can see very, in the first couple of years, 52, 56, and so on, you're not seeing much of any 
indication of, in this case, cesium-137 in the honeydew honey. And then the weapons testing, the Chinese were doing some atmospheric testing. There was some testing done in the United States and remote areas and so on in other countries. And you can see little gears where the cesium level popped up because of all that. And then there's no doubt when Chernobyl went off, but if you watch all the way through 94, you can see that the background level in the environment uh, that these bees were collecting honeydew from um, never did come back all the way, at least in 94, was still nothing like it was before Chernobyl. So some of these events have long lasting effects, but here's another example of samples from a citizen a beekeeper who didn't even know he was going to be uh, entering his honey into a study that uh, had some really interesting and significant um, findings. So I'm going to step a little bit to the side, and I've been talking about the type of work that I and others have been doing for most of our careers in terms of using bees and sentinel systems. When we sample beehives, for the things the bees bring back, and they're not really very discriminatory about what they're bringing back. I think this is more accidental in uh, input than that the bees went out to look for arsenic, for example. But to do this kind of work, it was expensive, time consuming. The sample preps generally had to be multiple. You had different ways you had to prep different samples for different types of analysis. Well, the technology has gotten considerably better and the good news is that the laboratories that were few and far between and only accessible to people like myself, or we did our own work, those kind of laboratories are now available to you, the public, and you as beekeepers. So if you, for example, want to know what kind of pesticides in your bees, you can send them to Roger Simons or Jonathan Barber at the National Science Laboratories in uh, Gastonia, North Carolina. Now call them before you do so but they will take your samples. They will charge you a fee, but they'll happily analyze them. And here in 2010 is an example from uh, a, uh, a comb sample we sent to them. We could do comb pollen bees, but we were sending them samples from the corn belt of uh, the United States. And at that time they were doing something like 183 different pesticides with discrimination or limited detection down to one to two parts per million for a lot of things. Some chemicals, they they weren't quite as sensitive. The limits of the detection were 10 or 20 parts per, per billion. These are all in parts per billion. Nowadays, they're doing closer to 300 chemicals. And they, for the most part, their detection limits are down to one to five parts per billion. So if you want to screen samples for pesticides, you can send them there. Now, bees also bring back microbes. That shouldn't be any surprise. We know that they share uh, bee diseases, but they also carry plant diseases. So. The Italians, for example, as far back as 2002, were using bees and sampling bees to detect uh, emergent uh, outbreaks of fire, fire blight before it actually was visible in orchards. And that made them pretty excite, excited. Now we've done some work with this. We did a major study with the US Army in 2010 um, when colony collapse disease was really rampant. We've had over 95,000 people view that paper. We've had some more recent work that is confirmatory of some of the uh, findings we had. And the good news, though, is the instrumentation that we had access to in the Army military labs has now migrated to Montana, to Victor, Montana, where Dave Wick uh, is um, running an analytical lab. And it's open to beekeepers, and his laboratory is all the instrumentation, the access of them, the setup of the laboratory, the sampling, the analysis and so on has been paid for by beekeepers. So he views his lab as a, a laboratory set up for beekeepers, by beekeepers, funded by beekeepers. And this is essentially beekeepers that work with uh, for other beekeepers, try to get a better handle on what kinds of uh, pests and diseases, particularly the microbial pathogens, are in our bees. And just for your information, this year out came a book of all the work that he and his brother Charles, who was with the Army, did called The Microbial Diversity in Honeybees. And the really good news is that Dave Wick now has a mobile laboratory. He, re he, he overhauled and uh, converted a, an ambulance into a virus chasing lab. He can bring, if you got a problem and it's a big one, say if we get another thing like CCD, he can drive his mobile lab on site and do iterative testing. 
So my point here is no longer is, is broad spectrum chemical and biological monitoring only available to people like myself that have the uh, facilities to do it uh, or could afford to contract, but these are available to all of you. And I really think it's about time we all, whether we're researchers or beekeepers or apiculture inspectors, and we can surely identify some things like mites by washes and foul brood because they're clearly visible, but there's a lot of things that we can't see. We can't see viruses. We don't know if they've been uh, uh, hit by a pesticide exposure. We might suspect it, but then we don't know what pesticide it might be. Now, if our pets get sick or our cows or our pigs or our chickens get sick, we take them to the veterinarian and the veterinarian may run diagnostic tests. And I'm here tonight to say to you, that capability is open and available to all of you, whether you got one bee colony or tens of thousands. And why don't we do the same for our bees that we do for our pests and livestock? You got a problem, you don't know what it is, it's likely to be either chemical or biological. Uh, save money, send it to the lab with your first guess that you think is most probable. If they don't find anything, send the other half of the samples to the other type lab. So that's my soapbox message today. Here is a photograph of the world's first fully loaded sensor equipped data streaming beehive. It was, we had 27 of these in Baltimore, Maryland in 1995. And as I say, we were streaming that data all the way to Montana. There's a large monograph on bee sensing things called, by de Villiers called the ecological importance of honeybees and their relevance to ecotoxicology. And I see I misspelled that. Uh, in honeybees, it's a book by Taylor and Francis. It's uh, uh, over 300 pages long. And in their um, preamble to the book, they call out the Bee Alert project that we ran as the illustration of the concept of real-time monitoring the bee colonies, saying that we use domesticated honeybees, bees hives equipped with sensors, chemical analysis, and computer facilities for early detection of the presence of contaminants. And that is true then and it's true today. Now here's a illustration of a bi-directional bee counter. It counts every bee coming and going 200 times a second, sums that data every five minutes and plots it. And in this particular plot from the 1997, we had seven colonies at this, in one apiary here, we had five apiaries, we had colonies in like this, but each of the horizontal rows and colors is a different bee colony within the same apiary. All of the vertical columns are different days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and the far right one is the sum for the week. It doesn't take much to look at this and realize that the flight activity patterns vary somewhat by the strength of the colony, like that top blue one's a little weaker, and that red one's a really strong colony, and that one uh, upper yellow one is. But you can see that all the colonies are showing flight activities during the day that more or less mirror each other. That's more or less driven by what flowers are in bloom, which are yielding nectar, which are yielding pollen, and what the weather's like. Because on Thursday, you see some hiccups in it, and a little bit of the same on Friday. And what that's all about is the weather event coming through, a thunderstorm. They're really common in Maryland, and so you, or windstorms and so on. So you can really tell a lot what's going on with the forager population with a really good bee counter. Now, you can tell more than just the storms. Well, we all know that bees come racing home before a thunderstorm, but here you can see the event period. These are outgoing bees from 6 a.m. in the morning to 7 p.m. on the day when in midday a thunderstorm rolls through. What we found is that generally somewhere on the order of about 20 minutes to 30 minutes before a storm appears on the horizon and sweeps in, the bees are already rolling home, looking to come home to safety. What we didn't know, but found out when we have multiple colonies with equipped with counters, if you get, say, a late afternoon thunder shower, which is really common out in Maryland, you can expect that the bee flight activity will drop off, the bees will stay in the hive, and then as soon as the rain stops to slack off, some of the colonies go to work right away. But a lot of the colonies just say, ah, that's it, we rained out for the day and they quit for the day and they won't fly until the next day. Now, this could be an interesting thing for selection of uh, bees for local areas for honey production. 
If you're in Seattle, you want those bees that essentially go to work right away. If you're in New Mexico, you might wait for the uh, rain to hopefully launch or, or you know, be a factor in triggering a new bloom. And so if the bees save their energy and wait until the bloom starts to come on, that would be useful. We all use smoke to work our bees. Well, you don't have to use a smoker. All you have to do is smoke a cigarette. We had a research assistant student who we sent out to Maryland. And when the data came in, we saw things like this. The uh, drop you see this here is when he was walking through one of our apiaries and he stopped in front of a beehive to look at it, puffing on his cigarette. And as soon as he did, the flight activity responded by a big drop. Now, even worse is we found out that we could see where he was at in the bee yard and where he was walking through it by the time of the day, because that top one on the red one, all those spikes and so on are a, a result of him standing in front of a beehive smoking a cigarette. In this case, we're, pl uh, we're plotting the, uh, the bees. Go uh, um, in, it's, well, we're pl plotting the total uh, flight activity, but he was greatly disruptive to him. He was a chain smoker, and we had to uh, require him not to smoke when he was working the bees in the hive. So this is how sensitive beehives are just even their foraging and flight to anybody in front of their hives, especially if they're smoking a cigarette. Now, this one's for Seal and for Rich. I told them I had this one because they called me when they were, were seeing that other people talked about when does the temperature spike hit. We got lots of temperature spikes that we saw. We had sensor, we had a, uh, we actually had at least two temperature sensors in every one of our hives on the left and the right side of the beehives. In the, the two lines uh, kind of in the middle there that are running across kind of the middle of the chart, those are the right and left um, temperature centers in the brood nest. And you can see they're tracking each other very clearly or, and very closely. That spike you see is from our bee counter. That's not the total flight of bees coming and going. That is the bees going out. And you can see the buildup to the swarm and you can see exactly when the swarm went out and you can see exactly when the temperatures changed. Now we were, as I say, our counters and, and other things were, our counters fired at 200 times a second. That's a lot of data. So we would collect it up in five minute buckets as we did in the temperatures. So this is five minute data. But if you put that kind of um, resolution in, you can really see what's going on. So this, is, this one for Theo and Rick. Now, we also saw what Theo was talking about in Queens. The uh, top lines here, the, the green and yellow and kind of bluish and so on that are pretty level, that's the fluctuation you see in a well-regulated brood nest. And those were, these are multiple colonies. And the colonies that were, were fine, you can see up on the top there, the red and the green and the kind of purplish lines that start to oscillate, those are the ones that lost their queens, the queen stopped laying. And then we didn't wait for them to produce their own queens. Uh, uh, where the arrow's at, we actually inserted new queens. And you can see how rapidly that green and red line there, they're still oscillating a bit, but they, st they start pulling back up and getting, getting their act back together just as soon as we put the queens in. What we saw was that the moment the queen stops laying, whether she stops laying or she's crushed or lost, that for three days, you get small variations in the... Uh, Thermal regulation of the brood nest. Once all the eggs are gone and there's larvae and pupae left, so there's larvae and open cells, they get looser and don't uh, manage the core temperatures near as tightly, but they still thermoregulate. And then when you have nothing but cap pupa left, that's when they more or less just let everything go and, and let it go to ambient and it pretty well tracks ambient temperatures. So uh, I agree with Theo and Rich. The temperature can tell you a lot about what's going on in these colonies, whether it's swarming uh, or bees or colony size. Now, I take a little different approach. Uh, we pioneered the use of infrared imaging to look at bee colonies. Uh, these are some on a cold fall day in our Fort Missoula area with a really high-end research camera, but you can clearly see where the clusters are, the shape of the clusters, and how the colonies are doing that uh, one, two, three, four. That fifth one over is not doing very well, as you can see. Uh, and off to the side on the right, there's one that's really strong, but I suspect it's uh, queenless because it's got a really broad, not a tight cluster on it. And we published all this, and I also published several papers in bee culture. And the ones I put in bee, the publication cited here is the technical ones. The ones in bee culture 
are for my recommendations. I think of in 2015, 14 and 15, they're my recommendations for the cameras available to the general public and what kind of camera you need and how you need, how you can use them. Now, it's not surprising to me that you can sense the heat from a cluster in a wooden box, but I was surprised to see you can also see the heat from a cluster in a styrofoam mini nuke. Mating nuke. Um, and these are some of Ray Oliveris's. The left hand picture is one of his mating yards. The one on the right shows you two nukes side by side. The one on the left is Queen Wright doing great. And the one on the right got, doesn't have a queen in it. You see a residual temperature where the remaining bees are back by the feeder. Now, here's a different way of looking at temperature inside of beehives. Instead of one or two or half a dozen sensors, my good friend Robert. Madsen, who unfortunately is no longer with us. He had a heart attack and, and we lost him. But for several years, he built a nucleus hive, came to the University of Montana in the summertime from Chief Delknife with some students. And they spent a lot of time looking at the um, temperatures in the core of, a, of small hives. And basically he had temperature probes every single inch of space between the frames and e between every frames and between the frames on the wall. And that purple shape you see happens to be a good example of what a cluster in one of these hives looks like. You can see they're pressed up against the front board uh, right there in front of the number two. That's the front of the cluster. You can see the top of it is close to the top of the hive. The bottom has space to the bottom board and the back is, is drawn in. And herein lies the problem with uh, using IR cameras on the outside. If you only image a cluster like this, say from the front or the top or the side, you may get an erroneous estimate. From the front, you'd think this is a really strong height. If you image it from the back, you wouldn't see much of a heat signature at all, and you'd say it was a really bad height. You need to get two aspects, either front and side or top and front or some type of thing where you get shots and two different angles on a beehive so you can really see what's going in. Now, if you have data like this that uh, Bob had, he was able to stitch these together into uh, movies. And throughout the day, that cluster changes in its temperature and expands on a warm day and actually breaks up at times. And you see that cluster shape moving back and forth just like a, the hive is breathing. It's fascinating to watch. Now, I'm gonna go back to bee counters for a moment. Mo those of us who study pesticides, and Michelle Taylor, a former graduate student of ours who is now in, in New Zealand, did a study on methylparathion while we were doing the workout in Aberdeen. And she dosed them for a, a acute dosage and a chronic, trying to see what the bee counters would tell us about the progress of what, what happens when the bees are exposed to a known uh, poison on a known period of time. This chart is the traditional thing. Look at bees in a trap to catch dead bees. And you can see it about uh, seven days, uh, close to about 200 hours out there, uh, the controls and the, you know, you can see the immediate effects. And then you can see uh, dead bees piling up. But by 200 hours, you're not seeing much difference in the amount of bees being cast out of the colony. And it looks like the event's more or less over. Now here's our encounters from June through September of 1997 on one of our apiaries. Each column is a, is a beehive, the hotter the color, the warmer the temperature, uh, or the higher the activity of the bees flying through the counters is. You can see weak colonies, you can see stronger colonies, but they all more or less, just like that other chart, are following the same type of trends with each other. And you can see the same type of drop off in August and so on as they're coming into the fall season. So this is what healthy colonies look like. This is what Michelle's colonies look like uh, the outer two colonies are the controls, the inner four, the ones that were dosed, uh, the chronic ones and the acute. What this tells us is that at about the same time that the dead bee traps say the impact, the effect is gone, it's still affecting the bees on their outgoing flight and the bee counters. So bee counters really can tell you what you've done to the forager population and the foraging activity. And this, I think, is a great tool. It's one that EPA does not believe in, but I think if you really want to know why you would worry about bees dying other than the loss of the beekeeper, it's a loss to the state of the almond grower when the bees die and so on, and the pollination loss uh, because of weak colonies or impacted colonies. Well, bee counters can really tell you that. So other people have looked at counters and back as far as 2012, there was a group looking at video tracking and um, 
Theo talked about uh, talked about some, uh, and so did Randy. But in the U.S. here, you now can get you know th this is another is another the Teeters and Group had another bespoke. They built it themselves, a uh, video counter and an image subtraction system. You can now buy any number of image subtraction systems, uh, and there are a couple aims specifically at uh, bee colonies. One is eyes on hives. Uh, that's actually working with Herb that, uh, and his Janus Hive Sentry System. And we're working with the Janus Hive System. And the interesting thing about his system, it's about the size, it's a small box, and it has the type of sensor that the bumpers of your car use uh, for proximity so that you don't run into things and so on. And actually, Herb did his first work by stealing those sensors out of bumpers in the junkyards. I'm glad to see I've got on my desk here uh, one of his units, and will be another one that's testing his unit. Because the question is, you can use a an infrared counter like we did, uh, where a beam the the B breaks a beam as it runs through. They work, but they're sp expensive and they're high maintenance to keep the uh, the the emitters and the detectors clean because they get a lot of tend to collect debris. You can build a capacitor counter, which works like pushing a button on an elevator. The problem with those is that uh, um, the good news of that is you could tell a queen from a drone from a worker, but both of those things are really expensive. The video systems, and I really am looking forward to seeing what uh, Herb's uh, system does. Well, people looked at uh, have looked at weights, and here's some work by William Milky Miko, excuse me. Uh, in 2008, you can see that he was picking up swarms uh, by hive weights. Uh, but one of the problems is what do you do with all this data? And my partner Robert Second did his master's thesis on the data from the Edgewood colonies, where we had all these different sensors. We had weights, we had V counters, and so on. And he looked at weather. And he got a system that could actually a machine learning system that could predict what a colony would, what the flight activity for a colony would be. That's that kind of smoothed offline would be on any given day, predicted from the weather. That's the uh, the more jagged lines that you see. He also was able to predict the day and time of a swarm uh, emergence. Uh, per, per, only person I know of in the world to be able to predict exactly when a swarm is going to occur. So. I've talked a lot about passive monitoring, that is picking things up that the bees bring back, but DARPA, the people that uh, uh, developed the internet, uh, uh, the stealth bombers and a variety of other things, they do the high risk with a, but a high chance of being really useful if it works. They funded us to do a fair amount of work and out of that, we did the things where we have things like, we now have that instrument up there is a laser that is called a LIDAR system we train bees to find things like landmines, anything's got a scent. We're even looking for uh, introduced uh, African snails in Florida. And we can train bees just like dogs to sense, but we need a way and dangerous things like minefields to see where those bees are at. So we sweep the field with these lasers or radar systems. This is a light emitting version of radar. And that plot you see down there is a three-dimensional thing showing you where the buried explosives, the lamb mines, the box of explosives, the anti-personnel mines are, and the bigger the uh, the hump that you see there, the more vapor is being given off, the bigger the uh, device that's under the ground. So those are the kind of some of the strange things we see, which brings me to the last part of my talk here, and that is um, following the Seren subway attacks in Japan, the U.S. Army out of Fort Jikji wanted to set out an RFP for a system that could detect a release, a deliberate release of poisonous gases by some terrorist group, for example, within at least no more than uh, 15 minutes. And we want a contract. Now we failed in the sense that the bees didn't take 15 minutes to tell us that there was a hazardous chemical out there. We could pick it up in as quick as 15 seconds. And we looked at a lot of things from what the guard bees were doing, the bees stumbling around and so on, to memory loss and so on, but eventually found the cheapest, quickest, and best indicator we had of exposure to toxic chemicals in these bees was the sounds that the bees produced. And they, here's some examples from our patents of uh, the data. In these data uh, charts, you can, if the clusters are, the colored clusters are separate from each other, you know that that discrimination is highly statistically significant. In this particular one, we're looking at blank, blank air versus a control versus naphtha versus ammonia 
versus toluene. We can tell you the category of the type of a chemical that a bee encounters or a colony encounters simply by where they position on a three-dimensional chart like this. Uh, chemists I know basically are flabbergasted by this, and they said that's like a living version of a mass spec. Here's a plot on queen status. This is a really ugly one, but you can see lots of different things going on. We've got cleaner plots that uh, we can tell you when you lose a queen, what it looks like one day after, two days after, three days after. That's all based simply on uh, the, um, the acoustic signals that the colony is producing. Uh, not surprising, we can find barolomite, different levels and so on. Uh, and this was done by some folks doing, uh, had some barola farms, researchers. So we know that exactly what levels of mites they had and it didn't surprise me a lot that a bee might change its sound when it being, has a mite chewing on it. But this one surprised me. We can pick up American fowl brood. Now, since the fowl brood affects the larva, and I don't think the larva make any sound, I don't know why we can pick up American fowl brood, uh, except that we can. And in fact, it's one of the things that at the moment, it, it works better than, than a lot of the other things we might look at. So we can detect American fowl brood and even give you some idea of the, uh, how much is in a colony. And finally, we can even tell you whether you've got a carniolium bee versus an Italian bee. And in this plot, if you have time to study, you can see the carnies uh, in the, uh, compared to the Italians, we're at, one end, at two ends of the spectrum here. But as each of these was uh, invaded by mites, the sounds that the colonies uh, produced all converged in the center. So this all leads me to what I'm going to be doing for the next couple of years besides developing a course for commercial beekeepers. We have an app now that works on smartphones and tablets. You didn't, we could do this as far back as 2012, but you couldn't get it because we had to use high-end digital recorders and we had to have really fast processors and we had to, and it just took a lot of uh, instrumentation, cost a lot of money and it took a lot of time. We kept watching, smart uh, phones and tablets, but their processors were pretty well the cheapest that the phone companies could put in and they weren't fast enough. It would take 20 minutes to do an analysis. But in 2017, the better line, the top line phones in the iPhone uh, stores and the um, Android stores added um, facial recognition. And facial recognition is the visual counterpart to our machine AI powered uh, analysis of colony sounds. And with that, we went down to 10 seconds uh, in terms of the time it takes us on a good phone um, to do the analysis. So we have in 2019, we did our first release. We've been upgrading in the last two years. Our primary objective for the next couple of years is to fully calibrate this app on phones, we can't control the quality of the equipment. So we need to know how much that factors in because we have degraded our analysis capabilities a bit. We also they'll need, get and need analysis inspection reports by the users that took the recording. If for example, the analysis says you don't have a queen and the user says we do, we'll put that into a group where the analysis wasn't correct. If the analysis says there's no queen and it doesn't have a queen, that goes into a group of data where we get it correct. And with enough of that, we can retrain this system on phones and so on to become, we hope, as accurate as it did with our high-end equipment, which meant that we were generally accurate from somewhere between a low of 86% accuracy to a high of 98%, depending on what we we're looking at. Well, here's my wrap up here. So again, if you're getting nervous, I'm wrapping this up. At this point, with our app, and which you can get called the Bee Health Guru KS, the, it, we just put out the 2022 version. Uh, now you can retain and keep the reports, uh, the history of your inspection reports for your own bee management. That's something that our beta tested last two years really wanted. We now have the ability, and our system will automatically map by region any report of mites or fowl brood or whatever, right down to the meter of where that came in from, and it will be done as soon as the beekeeper uploads the data. Now, don't worry about your confidentiality. What's available to on our website and to other you, to you and other users will be more on a state or regional basis. Basically, we're doing the same thing as CDC is doing with the COVID outbreaks. 
Uh, they're not showing you down to whether your neighbor has it or not, but uh, you can see the areas where the problems are starting, where they're emerging and how they spread. And that's fully capable now based on the visual inspections of our app. And hopefully in a couple of years, we can forget the visual inspections and we can move uh, onward to um, using the um, acoustics because our, that's our long-term objective to replace the need for visual inspection with acoustic analyses. Now, registered users receive free uh, upgrades. Um, you can register on our Be Health Guru site. Uh, we ask for a small donation because this is all self-funded and it costs us money to maintain these sites and continue to develop and do, these, uh, and do the recalibrations. This is what the app looks like now. That bottom bar has been really expanded. You can see that world globe. That's where you see the reports being uh, put in of, uh, as people find outbreaks of different things. The history is for your own use. The reports are those that have been where you've say taken a recording, but you haven't yet finished with the uh, visual inspection. And when you finally do that, the final button there uploads everything at the touch of a button. And if you click on that B, because you don't know what's going on, it'll take you to our full website so that you have uh, access to much more help and much more information. These are the factors that we can look for. Queenless, virolamide, Africanized, small high beetle, foul brood, nosema, what we call a failing colony. If you don't, if the colony's just not doing well, but you don't know what, and where the app itself says the sounds are abnormal. It's not what we expect. Uh, when you do the inspections, there's help available right on the app. So you can get photographs and so you say, I don't know what I'm looking for here. There it is. And here's the type of mapping we can do. And you can, we can narrow this down by day, week or month and by region and so on. But here's the a global uh, scene from some of the data we collected in our first year. Uh, colonies that were doing well and colonies are green and colonies weren't doing well or in the right hand one, they're pink. This is again, what the home screen looks like. Everything works off of this. It, you can see the level of uh, uh, recording you're getting. What we're trying to do here is we need to get a lot of recordings. The one problem we found out was that we told people we need clean sound recordings. So please don't run your truck or tractor or, or take it when a plane goes over. What we didn't expect is that people talk a lot when they work their bees and many people, and I guess this is good, beekeepers are apparently ha happy workers because they sing while they're taking their be working their bees. I don't sing, I'm tone deaf, and I, I probably even scare off bees, but well, I guess there are a lot of happy beekeepers out there. In 2021, this last year during COVID, we really did, got a lot of good information back from our beekeepers, and, and Randy's one of our testers. We, he has a special version of this, uh, and we're working with him to try to do a better job on our mite detection. I'm really glad to see we got this real-time mapping in. We can replace things like VIP and guesses in six months of waits to see what the maps look like and so on. I'm not saying anything against them. I'm just saying that they have a, a building leg. The moment that any of our users click a button and upload a visual inspection, it goes into the map. So we are doing the same type of thing as CDC does, only we can put them out daily. And it's really nice to have that power. And I'm really interested and keen to see just how well that works. So this is my attempt to have another citizen science project that can have as big an impact as that one we did in Puget Sound back in the 1980s. We now have a way that beekeepers can tell us on the spot when it happens, what's, that they got a problem with their bees and what it seems to be. So we're asking people to help us, help us calibrate the app, help us uh, plot uh, disease outbreaks, become a part of what I consider a wellness program for bees. Let's find the outbreaks as they occur. Let's see where they're going. Uh, there's no reason we can't do this. If every state and every province would have one or two bee associations, I think that's the way forward for us. Get the bee associations, a couple of interested people to help train their members and start inputting from us. We, we this summer, for example, could start making uh, a North American maps of uh, where the outbreaks are at, when they're occurring and so on, just based on the visual reports. So that's my last thing to you. Let's start reporting and tracking bee health incidents as they occur in real time as we continue to work toward calibrating our app. And I thank you tonight for putting up with me. I know I raced through this. You will have the recordings, but basically that's my, my uh, kind of where we're at and a little bit about what we do. And I hope that, it, I think, I hope every one of you will have learned something or seen something you haven't seen before 
from this presentation. So thank you so much. I know it's late at night and I'm now open for questions. <laughs>